There we go. Yeah. Okay. Most of them follow the PowerPoints, the, uh, the quizzes. So, uh, so there you go. Um, I'm going to show you how to do a uh, article critique right now. If I can get this thing turned on. And if I can keep my language to an acceptable level. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why military people swear so much. Sure I do. I know exactly why. It must they're... be the intelligence. <laughs> uh, they swear because they're in uh, dangerous situations. And uh, it lends itself to uh, bad language. Being shot at. Not the most fun thing in the world. <sighs> okay. Uh, oh, jeez, I'm here and I'm wiping my face in front of the camera. Um, okay, so what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about article critiques. Uh, so there are, there's a, an article critique for each week. Uh, we're going to be covering uh, a select number of chapters, and I never know how many, how long it's going to take me to do a chapter. Sometimes I go off, I just go off on a strange tangent and talk about something odd. Uh, uh, I'm almost 70 years old. I was thinking about this this morning. I'm almost 70 years old, and uh, I've done a lot of really strange things in my time. Uh, one of the strange things that I've done is work in uh, the morgue. Is work in the morgue. Uh, but I worked in medicine for a extended amount of time. I know working in a morgue is something is is taboo to your to your culture. But somebody's got to do it, right? <laughs> so, lucky me, I'm the guy that gets to do it. Or I was the guy that got to do it. And it's not so bad. Uh, being a white guy and, and being, uh, being the son of a nurse, uh, I had no problem at all working in the morgue. And of course, if it was you guys, you wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, so I, I, worked, uh, I worked a lot with physiology. Way to start out the year. I have to run across campus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, too much fun. Too much fun. That's perfect. Yeah, you could use my bike. Well, you know, I was thinking about stealing my bike. <laughs> and I decided uh, not to. I just, oh, uh, I, I was uh, taking a gentleman across campus to see his advisor, oh. and he didn't know where his advisor was. It's, it's weird. Uh, anyway, that's what I was doing. Uh, so one of, the, one of the most important things that you can do is concentrate on the quizzes. And the reason you need to concentrate, oh, one of the reasons you need to concentrate on the quizzes is because they represent so many points. So concentrate on the quizzes, try to do as well as possible on the quizzes. If you can get, if you can ace all the quizzes, that's 350 points. That's a C right there. Then write a half decent paper, or even a really bad paper, and you'll still get points. <laughs> and that's almost 400 points right there. <laughs> that's a B. So you're doing really well even if you don't do any article critiques. But uh, of course, uh, you will want to do the article critiques because that has to do with, uh, with uh, article critiques have to do with what's going on in, in medicine right now. This is, this is it's like the wrong deal with that. Right. So let me show you how to do an article critique. Uh, okay, yeah, let me show you how to do an article critique. And I looked this up this morning. Uh, if it's okay with everybody here, and if, if Stephanie isn't uh, disgusted with what I'm talking about, uh, I thought maybe we'd talk about human sexual response. No, no, no. <laughs> Just plug your ears. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, if that doesn't offend anyone, okay? All right, and if I don't offend anybody in television land, <laughs> video land, uh, what am I looking for? Oh, I need the uh, new website. It's like Tomorrowland. Tomorrowland, yeah. That's not right. Why is it like that? How do you do this? That's not right. 
I'll do this again. Alright. I was just there a second ago. What if I can go right there? No, I need to show you how to do it. But okay. Wait a minute. I need to show you how to do it. Okay, there, the, uh, the, the library has a research component to it, and it's wonderful. So let me, let me show you how to get to it. Oh, I, I know what's going on. Okay. Sorry. No, this isn't right. Yes, yeah, update my thing. Why did you do that? All right, I'll just go right straight to Ebskillos. So what you do is you, know, you go onto the library site, so it gives you an option on the left side. It gives you an option. I don't know why it's not giving me any options. But you go to the library site, uh, you go to research. Uh, it's like the third one down. Uh, when you click on research, uh, it'll give you a whole page of stuff. And what you need to do is scroll down all the way to the bottom and go to a, uh, site articles at the bottom. And if you do that, well, maybe I can get there. Wait a second. Uh, <laughs> this is just not my day. What's going on here? And I haven't sworn yet, so. And Francis is counting, so. Best laid plans of mice and men. <laughs> now the internet's not working. <laughs> this is too too funny. And I didn't download it because I wanted to show you how to get there. <clears throat> but I can't get there from here. You are here. Oh, I'm going home. Why is it like that? Oh, that blows that. That was wasn't anything I'm seeing, by the way. Ah, library. Maybe I'll go to the library. Ah, there it is. Okay. Library page. Ah. Are you on the home page, Bruce? I don't know. I go on the home page and then go to the very bottom. Okay. And go back to the home page. The other. Is it this the home page? No. Go click on the Dene College arrowhead way up top to your left hand corner. Here? Oh, oh, no, the picture. Yep. Here? Uh, yeah. Huh. I have a different page when I enter it. I have this one. Yeah, that's what I have too. I'll, I'll be right back. And then it's at the very bottom of that page to library link. Right. Right. I don't know why I can look at it. Mine popped right up. <laughs> Resources for research? Is that what we're looking for? The database? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's what he's looking for. And then underneath that there's subjects and at the bottom it says psychology. Can I steal your computer? Maybe I can use your computer. You're trying to get to that point, right? Yeah. To that little bottom thing here. Mm -hmm. uh, That's an apple. I won't be able to. 
I don't think you have a connection. Click the right connection. Maybe you do. Ooh, you do. <laughs> that's not that's not what's on the on the screen. <laughs> Tell you what I'm going to do. I will. Uh, I'll download that for for, two, for Wednesday. I'll, I'll download the article that I was going to talk about, uh, and we'll, we'll look at it on Tuesday. Okay. Okay. In, in television land. Okay. There we go. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> Too we much fun. For I know. Oh well. So I've got a picture of my second wife in the lecture. Yeah, just the second. <laughs> or somebody that looks like my second one. <laughs> and I can't remember why I put it in there, but just to be warned, I have a picture of my somebody that looks like my second wife in my first in my lecture. And I can't re like I said, um, I I used to teach at a, a more traditional school. And when I say more traditional school, what I mean is. Um, they were 18 year olds. Hello? I'm in, I'm in class. I, I gotta go. Okay. I'm broke. My wife just told me I don't have any money until Thursday. <laughs> you can't have any more money until Thursday. <laughs> Actually, she told me in an email, uh, so she, it wasn't like that. <laughs> I, I don't know how she was saying it. <laughs> uh, uh, this is a really bad connection. Anyway, okay, so uh, this is biological psych. Uh, biological psych is about like everything. Uh, and one of the reasons that I teach this, uh, I teach biological psych is because uh, I used to be work in medicine. And because I worked in medicine, uh, my knowledge base is a little bit wider than just a psychologist's uh, knowledge base. So I will be talking about other things. And as, as a matter of fact, I've got a, a, uh, something that demonstrates uh, some of the things that we're going to be covering. Um, biological psychology is like the psychology of, of everything. It's like the, it, it, it encompasses everything. Uh, it uses physiology. It uh, uses uh, developmental psychology. Uh, uses evolution, so we try to look in the past. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I was going to talk about sexual human, human sexual response, because the question is, um, how do we know what what proper what what is proper? How do we know what's right, what's wrong? Uh, and the answer is we don't, because people don't talk about it. And because they don't talk about it, we have no clue. Uh, so you may have somebody that is being beaten every night. Uh, male or female really doesn't matter, uh, and, and they don't know that it's not right, or it's not normal, or they're being they're being damaged, or they're being injured every night. Or you may have a, a five-year-old. They had that uh, that situation up in uh, up north of Santa Fe where they had those eleven kids in that one compound. Were they being sexually abused? Uh, and if they were, if, if you're being sexually abused from a young age, you don't know that it's not right, right? Um, uh, when, when do you start having sex? What's normal? Three, four, five years old? Is that normal? Of course it's not. Well, we don't, we, but that's our culture. That's, that's where we are. Uh, uh, so we don't know. I mean, and there, so there is no normal. And that's the problem because we don't talk about it. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about it very much because if I do, I'll get in trouble. And, 
I'm not looking to get I'm not looking to get fired. <laughs> I'm trying to make it one more year. In one more year, I start getting my social security. So after a year, uh, they can fire my ass. Oh, oh, see, I said I said ass. Okay, that's one. Okay, they can fire me if they want to. Um, but uh, when we look at these things, and, and actually, there's a problem right now. Um, there's a problem with human sexual response. Uh, once upon a time, and the only reason I know this is because I've been in the field for a long time, uh, right after World War II, they, uh, they looked at, uh, at male sperm counts. And they created norms for sperm counts. And the sperm counts were at relatively astronomical. They were, uh, they were like 350 uh, million per, per mil. Uh, and if you know anything about semen, semen comes out and there's, there's maybe 5 to 10 cc's. Uh, so what are we talking about? We're talking about somebody who ejaculates uh, over a billion. Is that right? Yeah, over a billion. Uh, if he's got 350 million per, per mil <clears throat> uh, sperm. Uh, so you're, this guy's ejaculating a billion sperm. Right? Does it take a billion sperm to impregnate somebody? And the answer is, well, maybe back then. Uh, but if we look at sperm counts today, they're down to like 150 a million per mil. <clears throat> so what are we talking about? We're talking about a, a, a decline of one third. When I first started uh, working in uh, in, uh, in the lab, uh, the uh, sperm counts were that was the normal was at like 350 million per mil, and now the normal is way down to 150 million per mil. Uh, in the back, in the old days, in the days when I first started, if you had 150 per mil, we would have considered you uh, yeah impotent. Uh, you wouldn't be able to reproduce. But now that's normal. So people are having more problems uh, impregnating each other. <laughs> Getting pregnant. So things have changed. Is, is this, so what's going to happen in the future? Uh, are our sperm counts going to continue to go down? What is the reason uh, for the sperm counts to decline? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Uh, I know, well, and this is really a kind of a serious problem. You've got two people, they want to get, they, the lady wants to get pregnant, uh, they, uh, they, she can't get pregnant, they're having sex on a normal basis, yes, whatever normal is, you know, just ask ourselves what normal is. Uh, she can't get pregnant, uh, so they do a sperm count on the husband to make sure he's fertile. Uh, and what they discover is he's got a sperm count of 100 million per, per mil. Is that enough to impregnate somebody? Uh, yeah, in most circumstances, but then again, he's smoking pot. So what happens when you smoke pot? Yeah, well, it not only makes your, your sperm count decline, but it also gives you more abnormal forms. So he's got 100 million sperm, but like 70% of them are, are, cannot impregnate someone. So he's got a problem, and now they can't get pregnant. But you can't use marijuana as a birth control. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Would that also be like when that happens? That's also affecting the chromosomes, right? And that's where right. Yeah, potentially it can affect the chromosomes. We we know that alcohol affects the chromosomes. Because at that point, when they're at the sperm and egg point, they don't have the receptors, the TXC receptors or the alcohol receptors. Right. So is that why a lot of them usually just fail in miscarriages or don't even take at all? Uh, well, we see that in, with tobacco, alcohol, and, and marijuana. Almost all the drugs will do that to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> um, crack whores. That's a fairly negative term. A uh, lady that, uh, that has sex for money so that she can, she can <laughs> use crack. Uh, a lot of times they, they have a very difficult time getting pregnant. And the reason is because, well, the reason is because she's, uh, she's using crack and it has screwed everything. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, smoke from the fires, mm -hmm. could that change things? Could it change the way people sleep? One of the things we discovered uh, a long time ago, back in the uh, 50s, back in the 40s actually, was that if you were a pig farmer, you had a hard time impregnating your wife. Why would that be? What are pig farmers? What's going on? Pigs have a lot of testosterone. 
<laughs> it lowers their testosterone. So it, lowers the it actually does lower their testosterone. Yeah. The problem is that humans and pigs have a very similar pheromone structure. And since boars, of course, are producing masses and masses of these pheromones, uh, the males uh, react in a negative manner. So they don't have as much sex as people that don't live on a pig farm. Isn't that chicken farmers or a sheep farmers? <laughs> no, it doesn't <laughs> And the other question is, do farmers in general have less sex than other people? The answer is probably no, but we don't know because we don't ever ask anybody that question. <laughs> 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 Get them away from the animals. Not much time for the woman to explain better. All their attention gets everywhere else. So it's a question that we have to ask ourselves. What is, what is causing this problem? Um, humans up to this point, not, not now of course, we have, we have over 7 billion, and we're approaching 8 billion, uh, eight, yeah, 8 billion humans on Earth. At this point, we don't really care. But once upon a time, if you wanted a strong uh, group tribal group, I mean, if you were here in the United States, and this is pre-Columbian, uh, the more people you had, uh, the more likely you were able to protect yourselves from larger tribes, from larger groups of individuals. So reproduction was really important. Uh, the Catholic Church at this point is still, has still made birth control taboo. Uh, so you're supposed to produce as many children as you possibly can. Uh, but then once, when the, when the Catholic Church began back in the, well, back 2,000 years ago, or w whenever it began, uh, it was very important to reproduce, and they wanted women to reproduce as much as possible. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why they've taken women out of the uh, uh, priesthood, out of the, that whole uh, hierarchical structure, because they want them to reproduce. They need them to reproduce. And when you're pregnant, of course, you have the baby, and then, and then you're uh, uh, taking care of the baby, and you really don't care about anything else. <clears throat> and that's, that's well, I don't know. Anyway, all of this stuff is really kind of interesting. So why? <laughs> uh, so what is the problem that we have on the reservation? What, what kind of problems do you guys have here? Nothing? No, no problems? Child neglect? Child neglect's a problem. Um, I don't know if we can change that biologically. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we can. Child neglect. Uh, what makes you want to, and th this is something that we've tried to discover, what makes you want to take care of your children? What does that? Is there, are there pheromones? Are there hormones? Are, is there something that makes you want to take care of your children? <laughs> well, that's the qu that's the basic question: is if is there, and do and if we can find it, uh, then then maybe we could help people take care of their children by giving them hormones or something. Um, when my son was nine months old, my first wife left me, and he was still breastfeeding, but she took off. She's gone. She ran off with somebody. <laughs> and it wasn't me. <laughs> she never was a very good mother. Um, and of course, so when you're selecting a mate, uh, do you select them for their maternal instincts? Can you tell? What do, you, what, do, what do men use as a criteria for selecting a mate? Is maternal instincts one of the things that they're looking for in a woman? Wow, did you see that one going past? Wow, does she have great maternal instincts? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I went out with Sally the other night. Well, she's, she's going to be a great mother. That's not what they're thinking about. No. Usually has something to do with sex. It has nothing to do with maternal instincts. So when I was selecting a mate the first time, maternal instincts didn't even come to mind. Well, they kind of did, but not very much. It was mostly sex. You know? So if she has a lot of sex, does that mean that she's going to be a good mother? Has one thing has absolutely nothing to do with the other. So males aren't really using very good criteria. So women, when they select a mate, 
do they say, wow, this guy's going to take care of us really good. <laughs> He's a great provider. Is that one of the things you talk about to yourself? Your girlfriends not all get together young, and you not say... Not at a young age, but maybe at a more mature age. Golly, how old do you have to be before you start, <laughs> you start talking about this stuff? <clears throat> Fifties no. or sixties? Anyway, okay. Uh, so these are all these are all very important questions. Uh, so child neglect may have something to do with that. I was thinking more like diabetes. Yeah, diabetes right. is a really serious problem. Or alcoholism. Uh, where or why? Why? Why are you drinking? Why do people drink so much? Uh, what's going on here? Uh, if we if we took, looked at all of the ethnic groups in the United States. Uh, what group drinks more than anybody else? I do. Yeah. I don't. I don't drink Not all. you. <laughs> White people. <laughs> White people, they're number one. <laughs> yeah, they drink a lot more than anybody else. But you guys are number two. Well, the difference is, of course, the white people have been drinking for like an hour. We're the ones that invented alcohol, I think. Uh, so we've been drinking forever. You guys have been drinking for four or five hundred years. So you haven't figured it out yet. And we figured it out thousands of years ago. Uh, most of the white people that were going to die from alcohol consumption died a long time ago. Really? Oh, yeah. there's, probably, there's probably Emperor Nero's days. <laughs> yeah, probably you're right. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Italians, the Romans and the Greeks, they drank wine. They didn't drink, they couldn't drink the water. The water was contaminated. They were contaminating their own water. Yeah. That's how stupid they were, yeah. They, they turn their rivers into sewers. And if you go to a Europe today, uh, the Rhine River, the Danube, you know, all of the rivers, the Moselle, they're all contaminated with, with, with sewage. So you can't drink the water. That's why they drink so much alcohol over there. I don't know where they get their water from. Well, we won't go into that. <laughs> Central premise of biological psychology is that the bodily processes, particularly those of the nervous system, are the basis of all behavior. And of course, that's uh, if we look at uh, Dr. Wolf, we look at uh, Dr. Kine. Dr. Kine is a cognitive psychologist, and Dr. Wolf is a neuropsychologist. Nice. Uh, so they believe uh, very strongly that this is true. That we can look at structures in the brain, we can discover why one thing or, or another is taking place. Biological psychology is a multi is multidisciplinary in scope and draws on knowledge produced in diverse scientific fields in an effort to produce integrated descriptions of the generation of behavior. There's a reason why I'm teaching this class. It's not just because I, I was uh, I was in medicine. Uh, yes, it is. It's mainly because I was in medicine. Uh, so I have a psych psychological background, I have a biological background, uh, I have a physiological background, I taught anatomy and physiology, I'm not an engineer and I'm not a neurologist. Uh, however, Dr. Wolf is a neurologist. <clears throat> Very, she's a fascinating person to talk to. So if we look at all the areas that uh, have something to do uh, with biological psychology, it's fed, uh, it's fed by a lot of different disciplines. <clears throat> Now the problem in, e in education today is, the, is that nobody is a generalist. We aren't generalists. They teach us to uh, be specific. Yes, we have to be myopic. And this is one of the problems of psychology. Dr. Klein is a cognitive psychologist. So this is the piece of the puzzle that she has. Well, there's a hell of a lot more stuff out there. Look at all this stuff that, that feeds into it. I uh, just got a magazine on Friday, Archaeology Magazine, Paleontology. Uh, paleontology is one of my passions, one of my, my interests. Uh, anatomy and physiology, anatomy is another. Uh, and that's the reason why I'm teaching this class. Otherwise, I teach it from two different perspectives. But I have lots of different perspectives. I have degrees in a lot of different areas. One of them is in English, so I can correct your paper <laughs> grammatically, <laughs> which is kind of kind of interesting. Pharmacology is another area that I I didn't mean to, but I got into because uh, because I was dealing with uh, 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 psychoneuropharmacology, and that's why I teach uh, the drug abuse class uh, because of my background in pharmacology. So there's a lot of different areas that 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 I can uh, that I can touch here.
uh, immunology. I used to work in the laboratory. I was a laboratory technician. Uh, so we got into neuro, uh, Im immunology. Why is, uh, why is this person always getting sick? I was watching a television show last night, and, and uh, uh, it had Bruce Willis and, and uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, but Bruce Willis was somebody that never couldn't be killed. He was impervious to injury. So he never got hurt, never got sick, which is kind of like my life because I can get hurt, but I, I never get sick. There's a reason, and there's a reason for that. It has to do with immunology. I lost my spleen in 1985. Uh, your spleen is a major part of your immune, immune system. But I haven't been sick. The last time I was sick was when I was in the service. I got out of the service in 1983. I haven't been sick at all. I never get sick. I never miss a day of work. Sorry. <laughs> I don't need to do that. <laughs> I can talk about it all day long. It doesn't make any, any difference. Uh, psychopharmacology, psychoimmunology, psychoneuroimmunology uh, is another area uh, that is really fascinating. Now, why don't I get sick? Is it because I have such a positive attitude? Do I have a lot of serotonin? <sighs> Negative things happen to me. I had a heart attack, that's, that's kind of like being sick, isn't it? It's more a condition than it is a sickness. I have a picture of my, my ex-wife. Are you ready? Mm. All right. This is actually not my ex-wife. Well, my ex-wife, well, that's, she, no, that's not a very good picture, is it? Anyway, that's what my ex-wife looked like. Dang, Bruce. I know, she was hot. <laughs> Red hair, too? Uh, she had brown hair with, with white highlights, she, she, so it looked like she was an older woman. Uh, but she did that for a reason. Um, I, I can't, I'll, I would explain it to you. This, and it has to do with sex. Um, uh, she, she was, she could walk in a room and all the guys would just start breathing for me. I know, it's so horrible. So, <laughs> she had this sex appeal that uh, was kind of confusing. Uh, anyway. Poor Bruce. I know. And, and Poor you, ask, you. <laughs> you ask yourself the question, well, why did she pick you? you know. I think it was more you. <laughs> why did she pick you? And, and that's an excellent question because the reason she picked me was because I had two kids at the time. I was. I was divorced and had two kids, uh, and that's why she picked me for my kids. Mm -hmm. uh, she knew I was a good father. So there's an individual that was looking for uh, a, 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 a father. So you may ask yourself the question, why didn't you just knock her up? And the answer was, I tried a lot. <laughs> but uh, she, uh, she, uh, she couldn't, she was infertile. She couldn't produce young. And no matter who had sex with her, the lady couldn't get pregnant. I know. It was kind of an odd situation. Anyway, eventually, after she left me, she went to, uh, uh, she went to see the uh, uh, reproductive specialist in Holland. And uh, they discovered that she, uh, her fallopian tubes were, had adhesed to her percolum. And because it had done that, it, they had an unnatural bend. And when she ovulated, uh, I couldn't get past the bend, the, the crook into her fallopian tubes. By that time, she was married to somebody else. Uh, when I met her, she'd been married twice, and she's only 21 years old. I know, that was her third husband. Yeah. How weird is that? But I wasn't her last husband. She's been married five times. I know. I like to pretend I was her favorite. <laughs> uh, good news, uh, she eventually did have babies, uh, but she had to be artificially inseminated. Um, the other thing that happened, uh, so they, they, they fixed her fallopian tubes, and uh, she got pregnant like the next month. But, uh, hi. Uh, but it, it blew out her fallopian tube. Uh, she had an ectopic pregnancy, it blew out her fallopian tube. So now she's only got one. And she's definitely afraid she's going to, oh no, she's not in. She's, that's, she's for the next class, thank you. It's the next class. You're a little bit early. Just a second. Oh, okay. I'm going to have to find more chairs. I think I've got 21 people in my class. 
Okay. Oh, not, not important. Well, well, it has to do with reproduction. It has to do with a lot of different things. Uh, was there a psychological problem that she had? No, not really, but uh, she did have a physiological problem, and she needed, uh, she needed her, her fallopian tubes fixed. Uh, so here's the bizarre part. This lady was, a, is, uh, is, was fairly sexually active uh, because she was trying to get pregnant. Once she discovered what her problem was, she got pregnant by, I think, her then husband. Uh, I hope my husband. <laughs> anyway, and he and then she had the ectopic pregnancy. Now she's got one fallopian tube. Uh, so she stopped having sex, which was kind of odd. It was really odd for her. Anyway, and eventually, of course, uh, she, she stopped having sex and she stopped living with people. I mean, she would, she bounced from one house to the other. Really, kind of an interesting lady. Uh, but she stopped uh, stopped having sex uh, because she was afraid she'd lose her other fallopian. She was afraid she'd make a mistake and lose her other fallopian, and she wanted to have babies that badly. So eventually, and it was weird. So she, finally, she married a guy. Well, we won't go. Into that. That's abnormal psychology. <laughs> <laughs> finally, she married a guy who. Who could be ejaculated? <laughs> uh, sorry. I know. So when we're looking at things, it requires the analysis of many levels of uh, molecular, macro, uh, and interaction of the environment. All of these things come into play. And these are. This is one of the reasons why you need an engineer. You need a. You need a uh, physiologist. Uh, you need an endocrinologist. You need a psychologist to figure out what's going on here. Uh, can we change the, the reaction to something uh, with our emotions? If we're upset, will we have the same, the same rea physical reaction to something as when we're not upset? Can you change your physiological reaction with your emotions? I was in class one time with a, uh, with a uh, not a karate, uh, taekwondo. This guy was taekwondo. And he had so much control over himself uh, that he could lower his heart rate. And so we put a heart monitor on him. And he was sitting there and his heart rate was in the 70s. And he was able to get his heart rate down to the 20s just through mind control. And he lowered his heart rate that much. We thought he was dead. <clears throat> he could have been dead. But he emotionally, and what he did, he just relaxed. And he went into a state of suspended animation. At least that's what he said. Uh, he meditated. And because he med when he meditated, his, his heart rate went down into the 20s. Now, my heart rate's not very high. It is right now. Yeah, it's 106 right now. But if I'm sitting down and I'm not upset about all the things that are happening, uh, then potentially uh, my heart rate will go down into the 40s. Can go down into the 40s. And it's normally if I'm sitting there reading something, I read a book over the, the, uh, the weekend, uh, it'll be in the low 50s. Anyway, uh, five viewpoints of the biology of behavior. Uh, one, first of all, of course, you need to figure out what you're looking for. And as we said, we are looking at uh, human sexual response. And I will show you that article next time. I will download it. It's kind of an interesting article. It was, uh, it was written in 1986, which is kind of, kind of interesting in itself. Here, here's, a, uh, here's an article from 1986 that deals with human sexual response. Uh, and one of the things that they did uh, was uh, they looked at pornography. Has pornography changed from 1986 to today? What do you think? Is it always the same? Probably. Naked's naked, right? Sex is sex, right? So what's the difference between today and in 1986? Where did you get your pornography in 1986? Yeah, you had to go to the store. <laughs> you had to buy a magazine. I know. You had to buy a magazine. It's the same old magazine over and over and over again. Uh, where do you get your pornography today? The internet. 
Okay, so in the old days, you had, well, all depended on how many magazines you owned, how many Playboys you had, or whatever, and Playboys were not very sexually explicit. But uh, now you can, my goodness, you can download anything, or not download it, you can just look at it. So the pornography today is completely different than it used to be. Because you have access to practically anything. And if you've looked at some of the lists of the type of pornography there is, my goodness, it goes on forever. I know, so what are people... So people are, have a, a different sexual response now than they used to have, especially the pornography. But this is an article that was written in 1986. Uh, had to do with, uh, with pictorial pornography more than, than films. Uh, even back then, if you think about it, um, they were using video cassettes. Now, of course, you can download anything. Netflix, my goodness gracious, you can get anything you want. And you don't have to buy it. Yeah, you just, you know, subscribe to Netflix. But uh, that's, I mean, that's the way pornography works. So, so everything's a little bit different than it used to be. Mm -hmm. I know. Never thought about that. I know. So the other question is, uh, so all of the all these studies we've done with human sexual response, they had to do with a, uh, a limited amount of sexual fantasy. Yeah. And now it doesn't. Now it's anything. And then now with the sex bots that they're coming up with too, with the, the AIs, the sex AIs that they have, like the full being an AI, a robotic. Somebody was talking about that. I'd never heard of that before. But it's now they have sex robots. Yeah. Sex bots. That respond and talk to people too. Like she'll, as soon as a guy walks in, she'll be like, oh, how was your day? You know, <laughs> <laughs> so you, told, you know, like totally took that reality of the movie into like an actual physical reality. Total. Skip the whole virtual reality part and just went straight to reality. Wow. Wow. I was still waiting for the virtual reality. <laughs> so everything has changed. Everything has changed completely. So the question is, what's going to happen in the future? Do people do do individuals have to have sex with each other, or now that maybe their sexual response is, is all individual, or with a sex bot? Wow, you know, I read about that, but I had no clue what they were talking about. I see, I know what it is. Goodness gracious. It sounds like something the Japanese would do. <laughs> that is where it came from. The idea came, came from, from here, from America, but the manufacturers in Japan. The Japanese <laughs> are so usual. funny. They're such funny people. They, um, uh, I don't know if you've ever been around people that are Japanese, but they're very prim and proper. Uh, mm. But I'll tell you what, once they get home, it's a completely different story. Anyway, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about that in cultural psychology. So if you're taking cultural psychology, that should be interesting. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is just uh, decide what the behavior you're looking for. Uh, the second thing you need to do is study the evolution of the behavior. How did this change over time? And when we're talking about the human sexual response, it's been kind of the same for an extended length of time. Uh, and now all of a sudden in the 21st century, all bets are off. All, everything that happened in the past may be not happening in the future. Uh, there are, are populations that are declining. Uh, Europe, almost all the countries in Europe have a negative population growth. In other words, in order to uh, reproduce yourself, you have to have 2.14 children. So every, every couple has to have 2.14 children in order to reproduce what? themselves. Mm -hmm. I know. Huh? It's, it's, it's like two live births and a miscarriage. No, 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 you have to have, <laughs> you have to have uh, four families with two children and one family with three children. Mm -hmm. okay. That's how you reproduce a population. That's zero population. Mm -hmm. So in the old days, when I was a kid, uh, everybody had three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten children. Everybody had a lot of kids. Uh, and now, of course, people don't have that many children. Rarely do they have that many children. Uh, it does happen in select populations, but very rarely does it happen in the general population. If you go to a uh, elementary school and ask the children how many brothers and sisters you have, if they have a brother or a sister, it's a, it's a surprise. Uh, a lot of single parents. 
Uh, so everything has changed. So we have to look at the evolution of the behavior. How has it changed over time? Uh, I was reading, uh, what, what, what was I reading this weekend? I was reading a book about the Romanovs. The Romanovs were the last uh, royal family of, of uh, Russia. And they had been around since the 17th century. And they were talking about all of these czars, the czars of Russia. And the czars of Russia were really kind of interesting because they would have somebody that they were married to, and then they would have select mistresses. Mm -hmm. I know. And it wasn't usually, it's not like they, they hung with the same lady over an extended length of time. They would bounce from one mistress to the other. They would go into a, a court and they would select the, the most attractive woman and they would have sex with her for three or four months and then they would find somebody else to have sex with. And this was relatively common and sometimes they would reproduce with that individual. So there's a lot of interesting things taking place. So you would think that there would be a lot of inbreeding. But, but there wasn't because they were finding these women yeah, from all over the place. Uh, this lady's from Poland, this lady's from Germany, this lady's from Denmark, and this is a Swedish princess. Uh, they, so they were mixing their, their royal blood, uh, and it got mixed a lot. Uh, the, uh, the original uh, Romanovs were, were Russian, of course, uh, but they would find they, they couldn't marry within their own structure, so they had to go out to other royal families and find their wives. So they married a lot of Germans. There were a lot of Germans in the royal family. Anyway, and there was a lot of sex going on with different people. And sometimes they would build them palaces, their mistresses' palaces, and they'd stay with them for an extended length of time. So what are we talking about? We're, studying, we're talking about studying the evolution of public behavior. Uh, I've never had a mistress. I've never had enough money to have a mistress. I never wanted to have a mistress. I've been married three times, but I've never had, I've never had a mistress. Uh, seems a little odd to me, but that's the evolution of a select group of individuals. This is the royal families of Europe. Uh, they not only married somebody, but they also, they married somebody officially, and this is the individual that could inherit their, uh, their crown, uh, but the other individuals couldn't. They were what they call them organic. In other words, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't inherit the crown. Observing the development of the behavior and its biological characteristics over the lifespan, uh, that's number three. Number four, studying the biological mechanisms of, of the behavior. And then five is studying applications of biological psychology, dysfunctions, lack of function. And, and the reality is that when we're looking at something, especially something biological, normally we discover it because of a malfunction. Uh, so we're not, we're not looking at normal function, uh, we, we normally discover it from a malfunction. So we, psychology didn't start, psychology didn't start uh, looking at what's normal. We, we, uh, psychology came from uh, looking at abnormality. Uh, schizophrenia, for example, depression. Uh, so we're not looking at at Francis and going, well, he's normal. Well, let's study Francis because he's so damn normal. And it doesn't work that way. Uh, we had to find somebody that was abnormal so that we were saying, well, here's depression. We've got all these people that are depressed. Now we have to figure out uh, what, why they're depressed so that we can fix them and make them like Francis. That's what we would be doing. But we, so what we would do would be to compare Francis with this depressed person. That's how psychology works. So we're looking at, we're always looking at dysfunction. We're always looking at a, at a problem. And what we're going to see in the, uh, the research article that I have for you that uh, deals with human sexual response, and actually it has to do with violence. Uh, so it's looking at violent pornography and trying to determine if the violent pornography causes the men and the women to be sexually excited. That's what they're trying to, trying to discover. It's fa a fascinating piece of research from 1986. But of course, the pornography of 1986, I don't think was as violent as the pornography of today. Yes, ma'am? What about the bondage pornography from like the Betty Page era from the Have you, have you, have you seen that, that pornography? It's like very softcore, softcore stuff, you know, but, or, but the suggestive, it's suggestive, exactly. The suggestive um, poses 
and then just the domination of the male, you know, the, the, the reaction between male and female. Well, actually, the Betty Page pornography, the bondage like pornography, female, female. it's all woman, yeah. woman, no, woman. Female. No, no males were involved. Except taking the photos and posing them. No, it was a woman that took the photos. Oh, really? I know. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's so funny because when I seen that, when I looked at that, the only thing that I saw that was that got me kind of, you know, thinking or even interested in that was just the fashion, the shoes. Yeah. <laughs> the Mostly the shoes. It seems like it was all about the shoes. So my curiosity is like people from that generation or era coming from that, might they have introduced a foot fetish? <laughs> into the sexual yes. world. Yes, and, and you know, foot fetishes have, have almost completely gone away. I know, mm -hmm. I know. I mean, these are things we used to talk about, foot fetishes, spanking, you know, all of mm -hmm. those. All of those things, well, they've almost completely gone away. They're only in select areas and with select individuals. It's really <laughs> fascinating <laughs> that we're losing our fetishes. <laughs> it's, <laughs> but, they're, we're, the but they're getting worse. <laughs> Uh, why don't we stop right here? We'll pick this up next time since we have more people on it. It's always a possibility.